Good morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing here in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. As having already spelled out back in chapter 1, God's incredible blessings for us, and then his prayer for them to comprehend and receive those blessings in Christ, Paul now begins to explain the reality of how and why we even sit in such an incredible place as this with our Lord and God to begin with. So let's read here Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us, in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's thank the Lord for his word. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth, Lord, that your word comes from you. That is your, it, it is your revealing of what you have for us, of what you desire of us, what you have done for us, and all that you have promised us and called us to. Lord, I pray today that as we consider the nature of the salvation that you have brought to us, that we would be eager to to reflect on what you have done, and to seek you and what you have for us today. Lord, that you would work in us and through us as you see fit. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, going back to verse 1 there, do not miss the directness and seriousness with which Paul describes the reality of of what our trespasses and sins, meaning our intentional and unintentional disobedience and rejection of God, have done to us. Right off the bat, he reminds us that we were dead, dead in our trespasses and sin. Romans 6, 23 is also clear. The wages of sin is death. It is all that sin brings. It is all that sin can bring. For sin, by its very nature, is a rejection of the very author and giver of all life. It is a separation from life itself in favor of death. The only reason sin doesn't immediately destroy the entirety of our being in an instant is because of the gracious nature of our God, who gave us life to begin with. But Paul also emphasizes here that sin isn't where we live now. It's where we once walked, but now as those who belong to Jesus, who have trusted him in faith to address their sin, we who are followers and disciples of Jesus Christ, redeemed by his blood, well, sin doesn't define us or our life anymore. Which this change from sin and death to grace and life is really the entire point that Scripture is laying out for us here. As the Lord desires for us to truly see the scope of the contrast between what our life was all about without Christ versus what it is now in Christ. For Scripture is clear here that when we are apart from Christ, 
there is a very different power, very different purpose, and very different spirit at work in our life and world. The prince of the power of the air, as he's called here, which is a fascinating descriptive title for Satan, emphasizing how he is working throughout the atmosphere of this world today, impacting cultures, societies, and lives to tempt and lead the world to emulate his disobedience and rejection of God's authority. And whether the world actually recognizes or acknowledges him or his influence matters little. He continues to work in subtle and not so subtle ways each day to sow discord and disruption and drive people away from the author, giver, and perfecter of life. And this is seen primarily in the way Paul says that we once lived and the way most in the world continue to live today, driven only by the passions and desires of their own flesh their physical bodies and minds, caring not for much beyond themselves and that which already means most to their presence here on earth, never even considering the implications of their existence or the realities of their creator. And we, like the rest of mankind, when we lived apart from Christ, were by nature, Scripture says, children of wrath meaning our only destiny apart from Christ was indeed nothing less than the wrath of God. Again, Paul wants to make sure we understand just how seriously precarious our position was before Christ got a hold of our hearts. If we are separated from the author and giver of life, rejecting him and the grace that he so wondrously offers to us, even while we are technically already receiving at least an expression of that grace in the progression of our natural limited lives here on earth, but yet in sin, preferring our own passions to the purposes of God Almighty. Well, in such a case as that, what could await us other than this? Having been shown such grace yet caring so little for it, Responding to the very source and means of our existence with apathy? If we reject the life of our God, then all we have left to claim as our own is our sin. And if we choose to remain and rest in our sin, then we can expect nothing less than God's righteous response to our sin. But, but... Verse 4 sets up the desperately needed contrast here. For our God is rich in mercy. And because he loved us with such an incredibly deep, deep love, he didn't leave us to our own devices to figure this out, to find him, or to pay the impossible price. But due to the full measure of the depths of his love, he came to us with life. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, meaning even when we were completely out of it, uninterested and intentionally rejecting God and preferring our perspective and our passions and our desires to his mercy and love, God still stepped down to us. He took on flesh, Scripture tells us. He bore the wrath of God that we deserved at the cross, taking the full weight of our sin upon himself, dying in our place, and then conquering death to make us alive together with him again. As Scripture emphatically declares at the end of verse 5, By grace you have been saved. And boy, have we been saved. But you know, far too rarely do we allow ourselves to reflect on the magnitude of just how incredible our salvation really is. This, this wasn't just like we got a bit of a flat tire in life that was slowing us down and God came along and gave us a new full-size spare so we could get back up to speed in our own direction. This is, we have been driving our life like a mad fool, 
We were ignoring all the traffic laws. We were running over whatever got in our way. Apathetic to our check engine light, the fuel sensor, and the temperature gauge. We were just charging ahead as fast as we could muster. With the car of our life, frankly, already on fire. And about to fly off the edge of a cliff. From which there is no return. And God so loved us that even though he didn't have to, even though he didn't owe us a thing, quite the contrary, actually, he gave everything, all of himself, with a pure, deep, unrelenting love for us, to pull us out of the life that we had all but already destroyed, and he saved us from certain eternal death and judgment that we in our sin were but moments in time from. Oh, church, we have indeed, by the grace of God alone, been saved. We have been pulled from a death of our own making into a life far greater and more wondrous than anything we could have imagined. For as scripture reminds us here, when our Lord pulled us up out of that pit of death, he didn't just put us back where we were so we could you know, head again for that same cliff. But he raised us up with him, giving us a seat, giving us a place with him in his home, at his table, in his family. He gave us a seat with him where we could be his, where we could come to know him, and we could live and walk with him both now and forever in the heavenly places. And in this, our God has shown immeasurable riches of his grace. In this age and in any and every age that may come. Through his immense kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Brothers, sisters, if you ever doubt the kindness of God, the goodness of God, or the love of God, just remember, just remember how He has saved you and all that He has saved you for. What great grace He has shown to you and all that he has delivered you from, and the expanse of all that he has given to you in Christ. And it's not like God just gave us some leftover rags and a hovel at the edge of heaven town. He has given us his best. He's invited us into his house, his dwelling. He's adopted us into his family and given us an inheritance in his name. He has given us nothing short of his very life. There literally isn't anything more that we could ask for that he hasn't already given or promised us to his glory and grace. And I, I just want to pause for a quick moment and add something here too. If you haven't received this salvation, if there's never been a time in your life where you've turned to the Lord and you've acknowledged that you're a sinner and that you need him and his grace and trusted him to forgive you of your sin and give you life, believing and trusting in his sacrifice for you at the cross and his resurrection over the grave to save you, then I want to encourage you right now to hit pause on this video and just talk with the Lord. Just be honest with him. Express your need for him and ask him to come into your heart and life to forgive you of your sin and to save you. He loves you. And he desires to save you and change you and give you new and eternal life. Do not move forward without trusting him in faith. Do not keep going in your own direction. Let him transform your heart. Let him forgive your sin. You know, this is really what verses 8 and 9 speak about here. They are the most often and quoted and memorized from this passage. And for what it's worth, if you haven't put verses 8 and 9 to memory, uh, I too would encourage you to do so. 
as Scripture says there. Let's read it again. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The reality of our salvation laid out for us. It is by grace through faith that God has seen fit to save us. Nothing more, nothing less. And this wasn't our doing. We weren't driving in the right direction. We didn't even make the call for help. He came to us. He paid the price. He grabbed a hold of us. And He gave us everything. This wasn't us. It was all Him. It is the gift of God. Our salvation is not a result of any works you or I have done. None of us could do anything to bring this about. Not a thing. Not a one of us is better than another. Not a one of us did something to incline God's favor in saving us. It came about only because of His great and gracious love. So we are left with nothing to boast about. No aspect of pride should exist within our hearts. For there is nothing on our part to be proud of. But we have been given every reason for praise. Every reason to lift up the name of our Savior in praise with this new life that He has given to us. For we aren't our own. Who we are today isn't our own making. We aren't the result of our work but His. And this is what I want to make sure we lean into moving forward today. As we reflect upon and consider just how incredible it is that our God has saved us, we must likewise consider why He has saved us and what He has saved us for. For we are His workmanship, His workmanship. Our Lord saved us and then got to work in us. Because we weren't going to clean this mess up. The one life we had a control over, we had wrecked. We were heading off that cliff. We had nothing. On our own, we didn't understand the natural life we had been given, let alone this new spiritual one that we now have in Christ. But our Lord gave us His very Spirit. He put His very presence within us. And He began to work on our hearts creating His life, His fruit, His purposes, His glory, His grace, His work in us. And these aren't just any works, they're good works. You know, God knows how to make good things. In fact, He's really, really good at making good things. And He is making good things in you. And more than that, He has saved you and created this new life within you for good things, for good works, His works that He prepared beforehand for us. God has literally prepared good things for you to do. Things done not by your strength, your might, or your power, but things that He has prepared and prepared you for by the presence of His Spirit in you and for the purposes of His grace in this world. And if God has saved us from wrath and death that we deserve and given us this new life, given us a seat with Him at His table, in His family, in His home, and He has given us His very Spirit to work all these good things in us and then even prepared good works for us to do with, in, and through, and by all that He has blessed us with. Well, church, I don't see how we could want to miss out on this on the good works that God's gracious workmanship has prepared for us. Why would we not seek to discover what good things God has prepared for us, for you in this life, and that He desires for you to dive headlong into? Whatever that might be, whatever good work God has called you to. You know, but to, to not do so, To not jump into these things is like a child who has been given all the pieces of the most incredible and expensive gift. The sort of gift that all children would long for and would desire to have the opportunity to build and then play with. A gift that even comes with detailed instructions on how to use it. And yet all we do is peruse the manual a bit 
and never pull that incredible gift out of the box. That's what it is to miss the workmanship of Christ and the good works he has prepared for us. So church, do not miss the purpose and the joy of God's workmanship in your life. God has saved you and worked in you for the sake of good things, good works that he has for you. Stop trying to decide where you would like to drive the car of your life next and start asking God, what good work has he prepared for you? For I assure you, Christian, he has something for you. It doesn't matter where you are, how old or how young you are, how busy you think you are, or how limited physically you may be. The Lord has been working in incredible ways in your life up to this point, and He has good works for you. He is not limited by anything physical, but it is simply by the power of His Spirit in you that He accomplishes His work in and through your life. His workmanship in you hasn't been there for nothing. And if he had truly run out of good works for you to do here, then you would already be in your eternal home with him up there. But you're still here. And he is still working on you and in you. Have you asked him why? Have you asked him where? Have you let him show you what he has prepared for you? What he has called you to in all of his good work in you? Don't miss out on the joy of your salvation and the blessing of the workmanship of God in your life. Seek Him and the work that He has prepared for you next. It may be a person to listen to or spend time with or serve in some way. It may be a place to minister at, to or from. It may be a group of people to learn to love and care for or even a task to give yourself wholly to. I don't know, Christian, what good work God has specifically called you to. Nor can I personally tell you what work He has for you next. Only He can do that as you seek Him, walk with Him, and listen to Him. And you know, I found, brothers and sisters, that I don't usually accidentally fall into walking by faith and into what God has for me. I need to be intentional to trust the Lord and to seek Him. So I encourage you today, be intentional. Be of great faith. Trust that God is working in you and has something for you to do, a good thing. Seek the workmanship of God in your life. And realize God's workmanship isn't you know, my own idea of what I want God to do for me. God's workmanship is God's idea of what He wants to do in me and through me. So are you willing to truly let Him fully work in and through you according to His ideas and not your own? No matter what it may seem to cost you, no matter what He may need to change in your life, your schedule, or your focus, let's let God do what He does best and work good things in and through our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the riches of your great grace to us. You have been so kind to us to save us from death, to save us from our own foolishness and sin, to bring us into new life, to give us a place with you forever, to place your very spirit upon us and to work within us. Lord, what a wondrous thing it is that you work in us as you do. Let us not make little of your work. Let us not ignore your work. But let us trust you in what you are doing in and through us. I pray for everyone listening to this right now. I pray first and foremost that they know you as Savior and Lord, that they have indeed trusted you in faith. And if they haven't, Lord, that you would grant them the humility and courage and faith to come to you now and honestly confess their need for you and submit to you. I pray, Lord, for those who do know you, God, that we would be eager for you to work your good things in us. Lord, that we would be eager to seek you, 
to walk with you, to walk in the things that you have prepared for us. That ultimately, as we see your mighty hand at work, as we see your good work in our lives, that we would not stop praising you, honoring you, and serving you with every day and breath that you have given to us. Thank you, Lord, for your gracious gift of life. In your name we pray. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ and seek the Lord and his good work in your life.